All right, gentlemen, good to see you. I wanted to start this panel off with you because A, you're veterans, and B, you both are in seats held by Democrats. Uh, I'm going to start, because I can, with the Navy guy. Uh, Zudi, uh, let me ask you, how important do you think military service is in your race when you talk to people? Uh, I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, Americans uh, feel that we're at siege, our house is on fire. They don't want people that are, get on a, are going to get on-the-job training. They want uh, folks uh, like myself and, and, and many other candidates that are veterans that uh, are able to hit the ground running, having not only served our country uh, abroad and uh, domestically, but also having been vetted. You know, I've not only served as a naval officer, but I have been countering radical Islam domestically and globally on many fronts, uh, running into the fire, running against the Islamist, uh, and calling out the Democratic Party for its radicalization long before anybody knew what wokeism was and uh, what cancellation was. I was being canceled from universities because I was courageous enough to stand up against the Muslim Brotherhood, against the alphabet soup of uh, radical Islamic groups. So uh, having served a community, not only in the military, but as part of organizations and otherwise running into the fire, our, our American community, our citizens, our constituents want people that have served to fix the problems because we should be a country of hope. And the biggest problem I see, Sean, is apathy. People are so yeah. concerned that there just aren't good candidates out there. Tom, you couldn't serve in the Navy for whatever reason, so you chose the Army, which is acceptable. Um, but, but when you talk around, you've, you've expanded that. You've really done a lot of work with veterans. Uh, you know, Zudi was right. I mean, very few people now have a connection to the military. We're seeing fewer and fewer people, 1%, I think, serve in this country or have a connection. Do you think there's a disconnect when you talk to people? Are they excited about your service? Is that a big issue that you bring up? Yeah, I mean, it's arguably uh, my the biggest biographical point that I'm the most proud of is my service in the military and in the Army. I will remind you the prevailing winning football team in the <laughs> most recent uh, Army-Navy football game, just yeah. to settle that score. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I joined the Army as, as a teenager. I, I had never even been on an airplane in my life until I took uh, a flight to basic training just uh, a couple of weeks after I graduated from high school. And that began the greatest adventure of my life that continued for 22 years, eventually was selected to go to flight school and learn to fly some amazing helicopters that I really, really could have only had the opportunity to do in the so, Army. And, do you uh, think Do you think that, you know, you, you talk about helicopters and, and the age of a lot of our equipment, yeah. whether it's the ships, the planes, the helicopters, I mean, it's, and it's funny when you talk to people, at least when I talk to people, they'll, they'll be like, they'll look at the dollar size of how much money the Department of Defense is getting and say, oh, well, it's, it's plenty funded. And you go, you know how much a ship costs? Do you know how much a plane costs? Do you think that people understand? I mean, I look at China in particular, and I go, we're not even close to, to matching the threat that we face. Yeah, that is a huge issue. And national security is a major platform issue for me, in large part due to my experience in the Army and just seeing the uh, near peer adversaries as we would identify them, China, Iran, and others on the globe that really present a adversarial threat to the United States. I think it's part of what separates me from my opponent. He's a career politician, never served a day in his life in any branch of service, although he'll you know, put on an army uniform jacket on Veterans Day to suggest that he is and you know, has never served in any branch of service. But laying that aside, I think this national security background that I have clearly differentiates me from my opponent and is something that I want to bring more attention to is the threats that we're facing from these near peer like adversaries that we're seeing advance around the globe due to weakness in the White House, as well as, you know, unpreparedness uh, through the through the current, you know, ranks that we have in the military. You look at what happened in the withdrawal from Afghanistan and our adversaries that were watching that and then the downstream you know, second and third order effects of that that we've seen and witnessed that I think yeah. need to be addressed, need to be accounted for, and need to be um, challenged. And that's a big part of why I'm running for Congress. Zuni, Arizona, I mean, in Texas are at the forefront of the border crisis. You have a plan that you put out on your website on how you would address this. It's funny, when President Biden talks about it, he acts like, if Congress doesn't act, there's nothing I can do. As somebody who sees the issue of illegal immigration up front, what, what do you say to people who might be a little bit further removed from the border in terms of A, the threat it faces, and B, what we can be doing without maybe Congress having to do act, if you will? 
Well, you know, our eight point plan, as you mentioned, is a realistic prescription. And, you know, so many people are calling for, you know, just calling out the problem, but yet do we have solutions? We need leadership that can call out solutions. And our eight point plan, we're only 200 miles from the border, as you said. Families I talk to as we go door to door in Tempe and Mesa, you know, tell me, uh, it's it's not just the the hemorrhaging border, but the crime that comes with it, the fentanyl, yeah. the 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 lawlessness that's destroying our neighborhoods, the consumption of resources in our hospitals. As a doctor, I can't tell you the amount of unfunded care that's happening in our state that we just can't afford. As our as our citizens can't even make ends meet because of Biden inflation and the suppression of small businesses and others. Our eight point plan is something the Congress can do. Number one is seal the border. Two is reclaim congressional constitutional authority rather than have the executive basically dominated this is congressionally run it should we should take back that authority and as an activist i've been battle vetted battle tested in the order in, in in countering the democrats in washington having testified many times to congress and we need an activist in congress not just this uh, lifetime politician of greg stanton or others and you know i have a primary to win and i can tell you my primary opponents are great but you know they're really not battle vetted battle tested they have nothing out there as far as solution i call for the deport deportation of biden's illegals the millions in just the last few years the uh, uh ending of sanctuary cities uh, uh legally through our uh, uh congressional authority and the use of the bully pulpit of activism where members of congress have just been too silent on you, the realities of a hemorrhaging border so so let me ask you that you watched congress i had marjorie taylor green on the show yesterday congress passed this massive 1000 page bill to fund the rest of 2024 they didn't take a stand on border security it was something that we were talking about yesterday what like at some point what would you would you have done anything different well, listen, I would I would say we can't pass anything until we stop the hemorrhaging. And uh, you might some might call that obstructionist. But the Democrats are gaslighting us Republicans by forcing issues that divide us, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's, uh, um, you know, continuing the budget, et cetera. They do that intentionally as a as a way for them to collectivize themselves against us and divide us. So we need to say, listen, I'm a primary care doc. Congress needs primary care in their body politic, and that is to deal with the cancer first, and then later the blood pressure and other things. And the cancer right now is border security, crime, the the uh, um, economy. Until we deal with these things, we say, listen, we're not doing our job. And I don't think there's an excuse to just sort of let the Democrats, when we run Congress, and that's why actually, Sean, our seat is so important here. This is a flippable seat that's now been redistricted yeah. and is D plus one barely. And at the end of the day, we are going to be able to flip these kind of seats because Americans are sick and tired of the division. And uh, those members of Congress that just sort of ignore their constituents and what's happening in our districts. Tom, you're in Michigan. What do you, what is the issue of immigration mean for your people? Is it the fentanyl? Is it the concern about, or, or, and where does it rank for you? Yeah, uh, it's all of the above first, but it ranks as the foremost issue in this election this year. We have a completely wide open border. We have fentanyl poisoning more Americans than at any time in our history. We have a dereliction of duty by this administration to allow you know, eight or nine million plus illegal border crossings into this country just under Joe Biden's watch, which is nearly equal to the entire population of the state of Michigan. Every town in America, and certainly every town in Michigan is now a border community because of that. Tragically, just 45 minutes from where I'm joining you from today, we had a young woman who was just killed by an illegal immigrant who had been deported uh, by President Trump, who came back into the country and just killed a young woman, Ruby Garcia, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, just adjacent to where I am joining you today. And there is nothing, no action taken by this administration. Our president already has the tools within his control to secure the border if he chose to do that. Yeah. But instead, day one of his administration, what did he do? He halted any construction on border security whatsoever. I went down to McAllen, Texas and saw the border uh, wall panels that had already been shipped and placed laying on the ground because Joe Biden failed to allow them to even erect the remaining parts of the border structure that could be put in place very easily. He also reversed Title 42. He reversed the Remain in Mexico policy. All of these things that would enhance our border security that this president has lifted and then has the audacity to try and blame 
Republicans or members of Congress yeah. for not passing something else that would allow him to declare an emergency yeah. if more than 5,000 people a day were crossing our border. That's a, that is an absolutely absurd position. The American people know it. It's why you see his approval so low. And it's why we need to elect good people to Congress to confront this type of dereliction of duty. People can go to my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, see more about that. And it's a absolutely mission critical part of what we have to do. Uh, to the doctor's point, you got to stop the bleeding when you're dealing with yeah. a casualty before you move on to the other issues of concern. And the bleeding that we are seeing is going on every single day without dispute at our southern border. And it is clear and obvious for everyone to see. Let me let me shift to logistics, right? Because in order to do any of this, you have to win. Um, Doc, I want to start with you. Do you do you are you getting the resources and the attention that you need from the national apparatus? And I mean, because both of you come from swing states. We got to win Arizona. You know, you got 11 electoral votes there for Trump. And then in Michigan, you got the 15 electoral votes. These are battleground states. It's not just your districts, which are both held by Democrats that are critical, the states themselves. Doc, are you getting the, the attention? Or is the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, are they in touch with you guys? Are they saying, hey, I know you got to get a primary, but then we're, we're with you, and here's what the, the turnout operation is going to look like? You know, listen, uh, thankfully, I've uh, been working at a national platform on uh, national security and on health care for uh, 10 to 20 years. So uh, I have that, that I have hit the ground running. Uh, and certainly uh, we have national endorsements from Charlie Kirk to Senator Kyle, Hugh Hewitt, uh, Glenn Beck and others that have endorsed my candidacy. So uh, we are hitting the ground running. Yeah, Could but it be is the party coming in? I mean, like th this yeah. is I, I get it. I've been doing congressional campaigns for 30 years. Is, are, are, are the, is the national party saying this? This is an opportunity to take a Dem seat and put it in a Republican colleague. We will be there to help you. Are they are they been in contact? We met with them. We met with the NRCC. They were very positive. I could not tell you that the, the meeting could not have gone any better than it did. But I will tell you, with the switch of speakers just a few months ago and, and uh, a lot of the turnover in staff, uh, they're still, I think they're months behind. I mean, I'm a first-time candidate, so the experts tell me that we, we are talking to them at a at a scale where we they should be last summer. Now we're in the election year, and uh, we're told to sort of look into May and June uh, for more clarity as far as uh, how to get our packages together to get national. And as you said, every campaign, especially the seats that we can help gain seats is a national campaign and, and you can't get the resources just within only within the district that has yeah. to be national because the Democrats are doing the same on their side. Yeah, I mean, the, you guys represent two seats that are critical, not just to President Trump, but to winning. And in, and in Zudi's case, I mean, th this is you got Trump, Carrie Lake in the Senate and then and then these congressional races. And then, Tom, in Michigan, are you guys seeing the 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 support that you need are they talking to you are they saying we'll be here here are the resources that we're going to funnel in yeah i mean we have had a uh, a very um very good relationship with the nrcc in this race in fact uh, uh chairman hudson richard hudson has identified this as the number one republican pickup seat opportunity that we have nationally this year Part of that is due to the fact that this is an open seat that I am running in. The current incumbent is running for the U.S. Senate, so that makes this an open seat, one that is an R plus two district, one that we are so, But it's held, it's held by a Democrat, Elisa Slotkin. Yes. She's running for the Senate, so if you pick it up, it's still a flip. It's a flip seat opportunity and one that we have to move on the ledger sheet over to our column. You've seen the Democrats challenging district lines in other states that are going to claw back some of the seats that we gained in the last election. Open seats like this and flip seat opportunities in Arizona and other states are of critical importance for us to have a majority to reverse the disaster of the Biden administration. And this seat where I'm running the Michigan 7th Congressional District is absolutely ground zero for that. I am fortunate that I don't have any primary opposition and we are laser focused on the November general election because we have to win this seat. I, I remind people, in America, we don't have a lot of last chances left. Unfortunately, we, we, we've we used a lot of them up already, and this truly is our last remaining chance to hold on to this republic and begin to turn our country around. For yeah, look, I, look, I got to say this just for everyone watching this. Like, these two guys, this is where it's at. You got veterans in battleground states that can flip seats. I mean, this is, this is the trifecta of what we need, right? This is good candidates in key areas. Uh, I mean, so... 
These are the guys that we need to on, on the front lines who we need to support to give President Trump a, a house. The last question I want to ask both of you, and I'll, I'll start with you, Doc. Uh, election integrity is an issue that's big for so many voters this cycle. Obviously, as I've said over and over again, both of you are in battleground states, Arizona big, Carrie Lake made it a big issue. For the voter who's out there right now and saying, do, is my vote going to count? What should I do? How do I get involved? What is your answer to that? I would tell them, listen, as a son of immigrants that escaped Syria and, and dictatorships that are the worst places on the pan, uh, in the world for any freedom, where the election results are known before the first ballot is cast and you're, you're oppressed and tortured if you vote any other way, I can tell you that uh, there's nobody that appreciates election integrity more than I do in my family. And uh, listen, there's a lot of transparency work that needs to be done. Uh, but if there's anything I can do as a federally elected uh, uh, congressman is make sure that that stays locally, that stays with the states and that the federal government stay out of the way of our localities for for demanding transparency and election integrity but until 2018 the republicans owned the early balloting and then somehow yes. we lost that we need to get back to you know listen making sure that the system is uh, is clear is transparent is fair and and demanding that from our bully pulpits and i will do that but we can't surrender that at the expense of letting the collectivists that are doing illegal things ballot harvesting all this other stuff and you know Places like Turning Point, organizations like them are doing a lot on the ground to make sure that we get the vote out. And that's what we need to do is move forward with hope, transparency, but get the federal government out of the way for localities. Tom, how, how are things in Michigan when it comes to election yeah. integrity? Uh, Michigan recently adopted a constitutional amendment that allows for early in-person voting in Michigan. So people who may have a hesitation around sending their ballot back through the mail can go in person and actually scan their ballot through the tabulator on one of the early voting days here in Michigan. We are going to do a full court press for absentee ballots that are going to be sent through the mail as well as early voting and election day because we have to have every combined effort to win this race. People who have a concern and certainly want to get involved, they can go to my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, sign up as a volunteer, and we can help plug you in to your local election officials to volunteer as a poll watcher, a challenger, whatever other, uh, whatever other issue that you may be interested in or available to do. Uh, I care, like Doc, I care a lot about election integrity as well. I was in the state legislature and sponsored the bill that requires our clerks in Michigan to issue paper ballots instead of just relying on those touchscreen machines that you can never go back and trace the legitimacy of the source data with. These are things that are important. We were able to get that bill signed into law, but there's a lot of work left to be done, but we have to win this election. Yes. We're going to need everybody involved to be able to do that. All right, gentlemen, good luck. We'll check back in with you. Thanks for being here and sharing all of this. Go Navy. <laughs> Go <Thank> Army. <laughs> all right. That was a great